What's up, everybody? Welcome to Gojo with Mike Golick Jr. That is me. With me, as always, super producer Brandon Newman and my father, Mike Golick Sr. And dad, uh, congratulations on the extra rest you got to get along with the rest of America because of the Denver Nuggets last night. How you doing? It, yeah, it is one of those things where, you know, I'm now back on East Coast time while you're still out there on Pacific time. So it's a beautiful thing to watch sporting events at night when you're in Pacific time. But yeah, this is one of those where... The other, the last game, I had fallen asleep right at the beginning of the fourth quarter and woke up with two minutes to go. So it actually worked out pretty well, you know, to see the last two minutes. But yeah, this one, I'm like, okay, I'm trying to stay awake, trying to stay awake. And I didn't. I fell asleep and I, I woke up this morning and looked and I'm like, okay, I didn't miss a whole lot because Murray and, and, and Jokic were just, just, you know, handoff, you know, pick and roll, just smoking. Miami in this game and here we go again you know you had the last game or Malone question effort and this game it's Jimmy Butler afterwards saying we need more energy and it starts with me which, which seems to blow my mind a little bit you're in the NBA finals and we're talking about effort and energy it's it seems very odd to me Mike it seems like an easy answer to give when you don't want to actually have to talk about all of the things that really do need fixing and I get it, it you know Effort and energy are sort of, I want to say like synonyms or boilerplate things that you can put over the top when it really comes down to, hey, defensive lapses. Hey, we didn't get our right. eyes in the right area. Hey, we didn't respond well to this run that the other team went on in that moment or we didn't manage our emotions well in certain spots because you're right. At this point, especially with the leadership on both teams, I am hesitant to believe that this is actually an effort or energy issue and just more of a, hey, listen, if you're the Miami Heat, you can take a little bit of solace in the fact that you got beat by a team that did something that had never been done in the NBA oh. Finals, right? We had never had two teammates in the NBA Finals score 30 points and have 10 assists each. Like, anytime it's a first-ever situation, and Dad, so far with Jokic, especially as part of this Nuggets outfit, we've had a bunch of those first-ever type moments. I don't feel like you could feel all that bad if you're Miami. Yeah, you got smoked at home, but again, look at the effort it took. And that's before we get to the Christian Brown portion of things where he yeah, decided yeah. to do his best Austin Reeves impression and go off this game. So let, let's let's talk about that for a moment because it was so special of two guys having 30-point triple doubles. Joker went 32, 21, and 10, and Murray went 34, 10, and 10. He got his last rebound with nine seconds to go to get him that uh, that triple double. And the way he got that rebound, it seemed like he knew it. <laughs> if he knew that was going to be uh, that was going to be the one, and then Joker is the first one ever to go 30, 20, and 10. Again, he had 21 rebounds and 10 assists. This made me look it up because Mike, what, who do we ever talk about as far as? Well, I mean, there, there's triple doubles, but then there's big numbers, especially rebounding. I went back and looked at Will Chamberlain and Bill Russell. All right. Bill Russell, who has 11 titles, Bill Russell's best postseason was he averaged 22 points, 26 rebounds, and five assists. And that was for the whole postseason. I'm somewhat amazed that in all 11 of his championships, that's a lot of postseason, that he never once went 30, 20, and 10. He was always at every postseason for Bill Russell. He averaged over 20 rebounds a game, which is ridiculous, but he never got that that 10 assist thing. But I'm still stunned he never had one game that was a 30, 20, 10. And then you look at Will Chamberlain, who had two titles, and his one in 67 with Philly, he averaged 21 points, 29 rebounds, and 9 assists. He averaged that for that postseason. So again, I was a little surprised that there was never a 30-20-10 in that. Those are the two guys I went to first, where a joker is now the first to ever do that. And when you're passing and when you're the first and over guys like that, man, that is impressive. I did see Tom Havistro pull an old stat line for Wilt Chamberlain, who once had a game in the NBA Finals where he had 10 points, 10 assists, 
and 38 rebounds. He had a 10-38-10 game in the NBA Finals, which is just... And the fact that, like, qualifying for those guys, because those two specifically you mentioned, you're right, Dad, freak show stuff. I think it was Tim McMahon who also posted the Nikola Jokic had the first 30-20-10 game in NBA Finals history per stats and info and had to put the caveat that blocks weren't an official stat in the Russell and Wilt days, right. indicating that if we probably went back and accounted for that, that might get yep. them over the 30-20-10 mark, which is insane in its own right that we'd have to account for potentially double-digit blocks from any of those mutants. But, Dad, this also underscores that Nikola Jokic, we talked about before the series, if he were to lift this title, then what? It's where we start to put him in some pretty rare conversations, right? Where one title for a player who already had his resume individually and has his game. Like, I think the coolest part about this NBA Finals is it's sort of forcing Nikola Jokic into, onto some people's plates in a way they wouldn't have seen otherwise. Myself included, like, I'm seeing more of this guy play basketball this postseason than I had the entire year. And it's legitimately fun, like, for people that want remnants of old world basketball. This guy's got every post move in the books. I heard, you know, Jeff Van Gundy say last night, this guy would be a star in any era. We do that thing yes. all the time where yeah. we're like, he could just play in any era. He would be a star in any era because he's taken what's usually been looked at as one of the most inefficient possessions in basketball, isolation post up, and he's made it look like a work of art. Joker gets the ball on the block, and I just sit back and I'm the guy getting my popcorn ready in the gift because it's become a legitimate joy to watch for one of the worst athletes on the court at any given moments, Dan. I don't know how to explain it. Charlotte kind of hinted at it yesterday, but yeah, the fact that yeah. he has been able to make this style of basketball, in my eyes, really enjoyable to watch is amazing. The way he looks at times backing a player down or taking a shot, you're like, boy, that doesn't look like some of the other great athletes in the league, yet he, all he does is produce. It's just stunning, but it's, it's also a sport I think it really kind of emphasizes that you need to stack championships because remember it was Bob Cousy back in the 60s when he averaged a triple-double, right? And it took it took Russell Westbrook, you know, year, a few years back to average that as well. And this was the big thing, right? That, oh my God, somebody averaged a triple-double not since the 60s and Russell Westbrook did it a couple of years in a, go, a row. Then it became ho-hum. And Russell never tagged a championship with it at all. So now Joker has, what, 10, 10 or 11 triple-doubles in the postseason? He's averaging a triple-double? It's almost like we ho-hum that stat now, which had been so long since it had been done for a season. That's why I, I think you have to say, okay, what else can he do? Well, he can win championships. That's, that's how you're measured in the NBA when you're an elite great player. And he is going to go down as one of the greatest players in the game, certainly one of the greatest big men. And we have great names to talk about with big men. I mentioned two already with Wilt and Bill and Kareem and Shaq. I mean, you got some monster big names and this guy is going to put himself, you know, right there from a play standpoint. We'll have to wait and see if that's going to be from a championship standpoint. That's what we start to measure by, right? Boy, he's a great big man. How do you compare him to the other big men? Well, how many championships does he have? And sometimes that's fair and sometimes that's unfair. But watching him play and seeing what he does out there is really incredible. Did you mean Oscar Robertson when you said Bob Cousy? Oh, averaging the triple-double? I think you're right. Yeah, Oscar Robertson. My bad. That's my fault. I was just going to say, somewhere Mad Dog is erupting with joy, though, that a non-Mad Dog member of the media mentioned Bob Cousy in public. So yeah, I yeah. applaud you that, for that effort. Fault. But you're, well, you no, and you're right, though, is it, it, it's just interesting because it is this idea of always trying to legislate when something like the triple-double works for us or not or is cool or is useful yeah. or not. And the one thing I will say, even regardless of the championship thing, is do the stats lead to winning? And for Jokic, they almost always do. Now... I think the conversation that we need to have with this Denver team about what happened specifically last night is what actually ends up being the difference for them more often than not is Jamal Murray, right? Because Jokic is the constant. Right. Yep. It's not like Miami where you kind of have to solve for, well, is this going to be a more inefficient shooting night for Jimmy? What kind of mid-range production are we going to get out of BAM here? Which of the role players are going to step up? 
With Denver, it's pretty consistently. Nikola Jokic is basically going to flirt with a triple-double in the high 20s, low 30s of points almost every time he's out there. His averages for the playoffs and the finals kind of underscore that. For them, and for Miami's approach defensively, Game 2 was about them doing a better job with Jamal Murray, getting Jimmy Butler on him, and in Game 3 it was Jamal Murray lighting it up with three threes in the second quarter and feeling himself early, getting aggressive, like you said, in those two-man games. Dad, he's a guy who, probably coming off of this finals, is going to especially if he yep. keeps this performance up and it looks like they're trending towards winning. That's another guy who we talk about who's going to benefit the most from this as far as their standing in the NBA. Jamal Murray is probably in line to fix that whole problem of Nikola Jokic never having technically played with another All-Star. He feels like a guy who's that got, got that kind of trajectory for his career now that he's healthy. Well, that's exactly right. And that's the key to what you said there now that he's healthy. He's missed the last couple of postseasons to the point where we talked about a couple of series ago when he had the conversation, are you guys going to get rid of me, you know, in Denver because he's hurt for the playoffs for a couple of years in a row? And Malone was like, no, 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 you're, you're part of this team and how he has grown. Because you're right. When you put these two performances together, all due respect to Joker, but this has become, you know, ho-hum every game for him, you know, in this area. I know this was a first ever in the finals, but a triple-double, a dominating. For Jamal Murray, I, I completely agree. To do what he is doing and giving them the two-star treatment, one a complete superstar and the other certainly a star and heading to superstar status, it has been amazing. You know, and, and what else is amazing, we've talked about all this, and the one thing we do need to bring up and talk about is on the glass and just how smoked Miami got on rebounds in this game. Yeah, we could talk about the big deficiencies from Game 3 here uh, because you're right, talking about Jokic, he thinks it's ho-hum too, so let's get to the other stuff. Dad, you mentioned the work on the glass. That was probably, if we're going to look for one notable difference between Game 2 and Game 3 or what really swung things because it's all built off one another, right? You know, the Heat missing more shots because the Nuggets play better perimeter defense leads to more Nugget baskets in transition, less shots of the Miami zone. But all of that is predicated on rebounding. And man alive, the Heat got absolutely destroyed inside the paint, in large part thanks to Aaron Gordon, who once again played exactly as big as he looks out there amongst the uh, sea of shorter Heat players. And Nikola Jokic, like, man, sometimes you get these triple-double rebound performances where it's guys getting a lot of uncontested rebounds. I'll give Jokic credit. While there's some flopping built into the equation, that is a guy who goes down there and was banging on the block for a lot of these boards that he pulled down in the 30-20-10 game. Well, he does because, listen, you got a guy who's not true big-time center height in Bam Adebayo at 6'9", but Bam, what a rebounder he is, right? At 17 last night to go along, I think, what is, what, 22 points. But he he battles in there as well. So even though he's given away some size to the, the bigger guys, he has to battle. So it makes Jokic have to battle as well. But, yeah, just, just a crush on the boards. And that's another one of those situations. Now a bounce can come a lot into it, but where – Jimmy Butler can talk about effort because what what's one thing you rarely see unless it's a wild bounce off a bucket is a follow-up rebound, right? And Jamal Murray had one of those where the, the ball didn't bounce right back to him. He you rarely you see a player follow their shot, quite honestly. But Jamal Murray did and got to a rebound and got his own rebound with a bunch of heat players kind of standing around. And that was kind of the epitome of okay, maybe that's the thought process of that can't happen. You know, again, it wasn't a crazy bounce back to Jamal. He followed his shot, and nobody boxed him out. Nobody made a move for him, and and he got the rebound and put it back up and scored. So when you get to rebounding, again, we've talked a lot about the word effort or the word energy, but, man, rebounding can be a lot of that about how, how bad you're going to try and position yourself to put yourself in position to get the rebound. Speaking of effort, I'd be remiss if we didn't bring up uh, human effort himself, Christian Brown, who, despite wow. the protest, I'm sure, of Kansas fans who are going to point out everything he did while he was there, is still at the point where they had to put up in the bio blast for him on the broadcast that it is pronounced Brown and not Braun, even though it is spelled right. Braun. And uh, he came off, had 15 points off the bench for them. And, Dad, he is the ultimate, like, I, the Pat Connaughton category of um, role-playing white 
white guy, white guys who make sure you read the scouting report because I myself had not fully read the scouting report. And then all of a sudden he got that steal near half court, took it down the other end for the fast break and decided to elevate in a way that I didn't know he was capable of. And so all of a sudden I had to reevaluate a little bit for a guy who looks like he probably could have played basketball very comfortably with Jimmy Chitwood based off the haircut has bounced that would yeah. have absolutely blown the minds of people inside that gym in Indiana. Yeah, and listen, he's, you know, 6'6", 220. That's a good-looking athlete, good-looking size, showing some athletic ability. Plays 19 minutes, goes 7 of 8, and, and he's not not that three-point guy. He only took one shot from three-point land, and he did make up for, you know, KCP and Michael Porter Jr., who were both, you know, bad. One for seven, one for four, Oof. 0 for two, 0 for three. They weren't hitting anything, so who picks up the slack? You know, uh, Brown is doing it. You know, he was a guy who did it. You're always looking for that other guy. We, we always say the expectation is, you know, is for Bam and Jimmy and Joker and Murray to be the guys, but we're always looking to see who's the other ones that are going to step up, like we saw in the last game, Strew step up and hit all the, a lot of threes for Miami. So that's always the thing to me is I the expectation of the stars to make their plays but who is going to be that other guy that's going to step up and maybe surprise us a little bit? And Brown was the guy. He was the guy. Uh, I I was also unaware, and this is just such a reminder how freaky tall all of these NBA players are, that they make normal-sized yeah. tall people look small. Yep. I did not know Christian Brown had those measurements. This is like Austin Reeves syndrome all over again, where just because he looks a certain way, I completely yep. undervalue the size that's there that would have him towering over me if he walked by me in the street. So, yep. uh, it, By the way, Dad, you mentioned the other guys in all of this. It is now a back and forth volley publicly for who's off the court, off the field um, team bonding experience can now lead to winning. Because yeah. remember, the last <laughs> time around for Miami against the Celtics, we had Top Golf for the Miami Heat or the Celtics that supposedly put things back on track for them. Right. This time around, it was the Nuggets going over to who else but Jeff Green's house. As we've seen, I think there was the profile in the ringer. Um, done by Rob Mahoney, six degrees of Jeff Green, who's now played 16 NBA seasons with 12 teams and over 240 teammates, hosted the Denver Nuggets over to his place in South Beach for a dinner in between games two and game three. So, Dad, team dinner apparently on the same level as Top Golf as far as resetting things. I did see the feedback from Nikola Jokic, the man of few words who poo pooed his own performance, who did take the time to say, Jeff Green's got a really nice house. Oh, I bet he does. And you wonder where, how many houses he has around the, you know, at, at what, 12 different teams, you said? And he's America's teammate with over 240 teammates, right? He's been a teammate to just, oh, I played with Jeff Green. Oh, of course you did. Everybody played with Jeff Green. He, he, I hope he's got a, a framed jersey from each team because that would look awesome uh, in his basement. I would certainly pick the top golf experience over just going to somebody's house experience. Really? But, you know, for. Oh yeah, yeah. I can go out and I'm top golf's a ball, man. I mean, you go just swing a club, eat, and have a few drinks. Yeah, I, I definitely would take that over just going to somebody's house and sitting around. I mean, I would take top golf over going to my house and sitting around at this point because I live in like a 900 square foot apartment. But with a house like this, again, if Joker, Jokic is saying he got a nice house, that man's got land, horses, and space. He's used to some of the finer things. Jeff Green's house got to be pretty nice. I'm sure he's got plenty of activities there that might be a little bit more fun than Top Golf. I don't know. That would be the interesting thing. Did he have activities there? That's what I want to know. Was it just kind of a bonding experience where we have some food, which I'm sure was probably catered in? See, that's a situation. Not a lot of players on a team, right? I'd be firing up that grill, man. I would be there. I tried to do that for your sister and the night before the wedding right at our house. I said, I'll just grill up some food. Let me do that. And she laughed in my face along with your mother. But that would be so much fun, man. Just to, that I would enjoy grilling up food for everybody. But yeah, you give me the choice. I'll probably hang out at Top Golf. Boy, this just shows like the, 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 core of who you are dad jeff green brought in a celebrity chef raul santa cruz who's cooked for president obama before to do this and you want to go in there and change the air filter in the house and flip the burgers on the grill yourself <laughs>
got to give credit where it's due. Brandon brought up a really good point that the Top Golf menu is underrated. So while I am lauding <laughs> Jeff Green for yeah. bringing a celebrity chef to the house, Top Golf is is doing some things on the menu front there. Especially, it's like anything else. You're active there. You're a little bit lubed up drink wise, and so you're automatically, I think, downgrading for a certain amount of quality. But at the end of the day, it still surpasses anything that it should be doing. What should be like ostensibly bowling alley food is definitely not that. Yep. Yeah. Oh, it's it definitely better than that. I agree. I think it is underrated. It's a, it's a wonderful time. You get a great area to hang out in and swing a club and, and, and eat and drink. I think it's a, I know companies go there all the time. Every time I see one though, I think of our, our good friend, uh, Mike, Mike Periano, who had a chance way back when to invest in Top Golf, be one of the initial investors in Top Golf and didn't think it was going to be a good idea. Oh, every time I drive oh. by one, I think how he's got to be kicking himself for, for that one. <laughs> I mean, what a, what a joy in life to live long enough to see yourself miss out on the investment of a lifetime. Yeah. Like, I'm still waiting for <laughs> the thing I could have invested in that ended up taking off and making a lot of money. No one from Apple approached me about the VR headset, yeah. so it looks like I'm going to have to wait a little while longer uh, for that. Uh, by the way, Dad, speaking of sitting around and waiting, uh, we're in the middle of the doldrums of the NFL offseason, so we don't get a ton of news normally. But this morning, this one popped up along the line. The Minnesota Vikings have informed running back Dalvin Cook that they're releasing him, according to Adam Schefter. Uh, Cook spent six years with the Vikings, and it's the usual order of things, right? He's turning 28 this year. He was going to put uh, $14.1 million against the cap in 2023. And so now they're going to send him on his way. This a Vikings team that's kind of in transition, Dad. Defensively, we yeah. know it's going to be a total overhaul uh, with Brian Flores coming over there. Stylistically, completely different deal for a team that couldn't stop anyone. And offensively, really, while some of the numbers looked all right last year, that was really the, hey, let's just chuck it to Justin Jefferson and see what happens offense that's going to get a little bit of a retool. So it sounds like Miami and Denver are the teams that Schefter expects yeah. to be in the bidding war for him. Dad, for my money, if I'm Dalvin Cook, Miami's the answer to that question. You know, while it's a yep. little bit more crowded of a backfield, you're going to a team that's a contender, warm weather team, all the things that are probably appealing at this point versus Denver where, yeah, Sean Payton going to be in that offense in theory sounds great, but a much more significant roll of the dice and in the toughest division in football. Yeah, I would definitely lean toward Miami. And I don't know, is that still the toughest division in football? You know, I was just thinking of that too. Or has that gone over to, is that the AFC East now? You know, is is that well, it with I, what the Jets have done? So I, I I I don't know because I know we said that about the AFC West last year, but the Raiders, you know, haven't done a whole lot, right? The Broncos certainly, you know, were, were horrible. Yeah. So I don't know. I guess I should say it like this. The toughest in getting to the playoffs, because I think most people expect the Chiefs are going to continue to be the hard cap on that division. The Chargers, if they stay healthy, should be the me second most talented team in that division. And so maybe I, I mean in terms of your ability to potentially make the playoffs or win the division, because the one thing you're right about the AFC East is, we can say it feels a little more wide open than it's had. The Bills should still be the favorite. Josh Allen, the new cover boy of Madden. But we saw enough, I think, attrition from them down the stretch of the season to where now that the Jets have made those improvements and now that the Dolphins are in the position they're at with Vic Fangio coming over on the defensive side, that maybe you'd have a shot of actually winning the division and bettering your stance in that, per in that particular division. Well, and also Josh Allen's on the cover of Madden, so that, isn't that a jinx, you know, that there's going to be uh, some issue there where we have to wait and see. In all honesty, the best division in football last year and the only division that had a 500 or better for everybody was uh, was uh, uh, the NFC East, right? I mean, they, they were the ones. You know, three teams in the playoffs with the Eagles, the Cowboys, and the Giants. We'll see what Washington can do this year. But back to, back to uh, Dalvin Cook. We kind of saw this coming. Alexander Madison, the backup who his best year, you know, a few years ago was 134 carries for almost 500 yards, had 32 receptions. So he wasn't getting the play uh, that Dalvin was, but he's going to be that every down back now, that three down guy that can catch the ball out of the backfield as well. And it's amazing because you're right. It is. We do feel like they're in a bit of transition, yet they won the division by four games last year over Detroit. 
you know, finished at nine and eight, and then the Packers eight and nine, and the Bears were bad. That division is the one that's going to be interesting to me because is Minnesota in transition? The Packers are not starting a Hall of Fame quarterback like they were for the last how many decades between Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers. The Chicago Bears, I, I, while I think they're going to be better, are, I still think at least a year away. That that's that's I think between Detroit and Minnesota for that division, and everybody's looking at Detroit kind of moving up the rank. So we'll see. And but I believe, uh, agree about Cook going. I think Miami's the best spot for him. There were three backs we had been talking about of kind of changing homes, and it was it was Dalvin, it was Zeke, and it was Joe Mixon from Cincinnati. Zeke hasn't found a home yet. Uh, we'll have to wait and see if the Cowboys bring him back because Pollard is the guy there. We all saw that last year. So still some movement to go on uh, in this offseason before we get to camps next month. I was looking just out of curiosity at the running back room situations in Denver and Miami if we're going to use those as the starting points for this conversation. Miami's got Raheem Mostert, Jeff Wilson Jr., some young guys in there as well. So a little bit deeper speed to burn, but a scheme that's going to put you in position to win. And for a guy who is as good an outside zone runner as Dalvin Cook is, I certainly think there's some appeal to going in a scheme that puts you in a position to do the thing that you best do best with even fewer hits. On the other side, for the Broncos, a little bit lighter in the running back room there. They've got Javante Williams, Samaje P. Ryan, and Tony Jones Jr. So a little bit less depth. You could certainly go in there and probably get more touches right away in an offense that we know with Sean Payton, while has been led by quarterbacks, also usually has an offensive line that makes use of the running back in a lot of different ways. So I would still probably lean Miami, but again, you're right. This is also interesting that Minnesota Vikings team, Dan, I think this is just kind of I would hope an admission from them. One, this is about you know the way we look at the running back position, guy aging into this right, portion right. of his career yeah. at that number. But also, you mentioned Minnesota. That was, as we found out in the playoffs, not really sustainable, right? They had all of those stats that kind of indicated that they were perform- overperforming in the margins in a way that wasn't indicative of how good of a football team they actually were. That should be the Lions' division to lose this year, unless yeah. Green Bay all of a sudden realizes all that defensive talent that didn't materialize last year that they've been stacking in the draft. Yeah, listen, I agree. I, it's like Minnesota isn't living up to what what they look like, you know, because I've called a few of their games over the last couple of years, and at times they look fantastic, and other times... They look horrible. Last year, they were looking great through the year, but we all kept saying, yeah, but is this really them? Can they really sustain this? Can they really make a run in the postseason? Can they be that good? And and the answer has been no. You know, they've always been, you know, like I said last year, though, they dominated that division where Green Bay had done it the last few years. So maybe we looked at them a little differently, saying maybe this is their year. But they they proved to end up being a team that's not good enough to win it and not bad enough to be at the, you know, a high pick in the first round unless they trade. So they get caught right in the middle of that normally. Again, last year was a little bit of an outlier for the regular season they had going 13 and four. Uh, yeah, I just, I don't, I don't expect that again this year. And I agree with you. I, I think it is Detroit, even though we kind of were a little surprised at their two first round picks, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in this last year's draft. I, I still do like the way that they're going. I just saw a video yesterday of a bunch of Detroit Lions players going through their favorite Taylor Swift songs, and Jared Goff <laughs> led with Getaway Car and included 10, mil, 10 Minute All Too Well in the top three. I've changed my tune completely. He's your future quarterback. Extend that man right now. Lions are going to win the Super Bowl this year. So they got that all on lock here. <laughs> Dad, it is interesting talking about teams in that same sort of position you just described Minnesota in because the other bit of NFL news that we had is DeAndre Hopkins is reportedly set to take a visit to the Tennessee Titans of all teams so another player released by the Arizona Cardinals this offseason had a big time number for them and now has been on the move and was linked to all the teams that we'd expect him to be right he came out I think it was on the I am athlete podcast and said he wanted to go to an organization that had stable front office good defense and d-line and obviously a quarterback that he could work with there and the Titans kind of 
smudge some of those boxes, right? I mean, Mike Vrabel, who he knows from his time in Houston, technically yeah. qualifies as right. stability. He's getting into that Mike Tomlin range of coach where every year he's there, you're going to somehow have a chance to MacGyver your way into the postseason. But quarterback position seems up in the air right now as they year after year are trying to draft Ryan Tannehill's replacement. And then defensively, certainly plenty to write home about there. But this is also a team that moved on from its GM in a really weird way last year. And just in general, offensively, yeah, you could go in there and be the man on a team that really struggled to put the ball anywhere in the middle of the field last year. But, Dad, this doesn't scream a move that has top-end potential that you would assume a player at this point in DeAndre Hopkins' career wants as being a part of a Super Bowl contender. Oh, I, I completely agree. So this is what I say all the time and, and have said this forever about free agents who have a choice, coaches about if they have a choice, like we saw Sean Payton, you know, get wooed by a couple of teams. Where are you? What What do you want now? What does DeAndre Hopkins want? I, I don't know DeAndre. I don't know what he wants. Uh, he's made certainly some money. We've gone all over this before. He's made, I think, $114 million in his career. Is he still looking for another big payday? Is someone going to give him a big payday? Is he looking for something geographical? Is he looking for something, like you said, having a relationship with Vrabel that he had in Houston? Is he looking for that? Or is he looking for a ring? If you're looking for a ring, Tennessee's not the place, at least in my opinion, is is not the place to go if you're looking in the next year or two. DeAndre Hopkins is what? He's how old is he? He's been born in... um, so he's a little over 30, right? He's like 30, going to be 31 or something like that. Just turn, Yeah, just DeAndre turn Hopkins is a little – yeah, he's a little younger than I am. I was going to say, he was a couple classes behind me. So, so you know, he probably thinks he has more than a few years left. Is he trying to get another big deal out of this? Is he trying to get a ring? So that that's and, – and I don't know the teams – because we, we automatically say, boy, if a Kansas City or a Buffalo or one of the top teams – picks them up. Boy, how great is that going to be? We don't know if there's been discussions with those teams. We don't know if those teams are trying to do something. We don't know what they would have to pay. Odell Beckham is kind of thrown off the one-year market, right? Getting, you know, what, $15, $20 million? Uh, So you know you're going to have to pay him, DeAndre, if you certainly go multiple years on this thing. So I'd be interested, the actual favorites for like Super Bowls or long runs, which one of them, those teams are talking or have talked to DeAndre? Or is it going to be the teams just below that that maybe are willing to pay to try and help them escalate that team? Because I still think he's got a few good years left in him. He's a phenomenal receiver. That That's just what I don't know is where, what teams are after him and where is he in his career on what's important to him? Again, it could be money, could yeah. be geography, could be relationships, could be could be ring. Yeah, and, and all of those things are fair. Like I heard Ross Tucker talk about this uh, on his podcast that most fans look at this and go, well, you should want the ring when in actuality most people put in this situation if they could squeeze a few extra million dollars out of the situation yep. on what could be like his last big payday. We don't know what the future is going to look like for guys like him and Odell who are getting a little longer in the tooth of this position. And so if you wanted to take that and maybe even find the happy medium, Dad, like you're right, Buffalo and Kansas City seem like if you were going to go football-wise, the best options, easy picks there but might not have the money. Specifically, Kansas City, though, we'll wait and see what happens if they rework the Mahomes deal, free up some money in that way. But a team like the Cleveland Browns, where kind of what Odell did with Baltimore, you go to a team that if everything hit rights and the quarterback situation gets back to what you expect to be, could be a contender in the AFC, could put you in playoff potential, maybe proximity to a Super Bowl, but also give you more of that money. Like with Odell Beckham Jr., yes, signing with Baltimore, that was before we knew Lamar Jackson was going to be back for certain, knew you were going to have Todd Monk in there, but still on paper isn't the situation that Buffalo or Kansas City would be if you were to do those spots. And so maybe there is a happy medium out there for a guy who might want to make sure he cashes in as best as humanly possible as he gets toward the later stages of his career. So that's another decision to make too. So if you're in his shoes, do you say, I just want a one-year deal? Go to a place maybe like Tennessee where your leading receiver last year had 53 receptions. You know, A.J. Brown ended up in Philly and had a monster year there. So, you know, they had a number of receivers, you know, 53, 32, 33, 41, 33. Go be the guy 
do a one-year deal, bet on yourself, knowing you're going to be the main guy, have a big year, and then become a free agent again. Now, I, I, I don't know. Maybe that's a thought process as well. Same thing if you go to Cleveland, and then you have that big year, and then you're able to cash in after one year of betting on yourself. See, that's, that's what, there, there are options out there of things to do. Yeah, DeAndre Hopkins certainly has options at this point. The one thing we don't have is answers. So we will wait and see uh, what the future looks like for him, for Dalvin Cook, who really at this point in the offseason are part of the last few dominoes. You mentioned some of the other running right. backs that are going to fall during this time period. So, uh, Dad, one of the other things I just wanted to kind of put a bow on from yesterday with, we talk so much about the live golf and the PGA and all these people yeah. that very publicly embarrass themselves. Do we have the sound of Rory McIlroy answering questions from yesterday when he was brought in front of the media and himself said he felt like a bit of a sacrificial lamb going out in front and having to answer these questions? We do. Here was Rory talking yesterday. Should the golfers who maybe stayed loyal and turned down live, should they be made whole financially? <laughs> I mean, the simple answer is yes. The complex answer is how does that happen, mm -hmm. right? And that's all that's all gray area and up, up up in the air at the minute. But yeah, there's, you know, it's hard to it's hard for me to not sit up here and feel somewhat like a sacrificial lamb and you know feeling like I've put myself out there and this is what happens. Again, removing myself from the situation, I see how this is better for the game of golf. There's no denying that. But for me as an individual, yeah, I. There's just going to have to be conversations that are had. I still hate live. Like, I hate live. Like, I, I hope it goes away. And I would fully expect that it does. Um, and I think that's where the distinction here is. This is the PJ Tour, the DP World Tour, and the PIF. Very different from live. All I've got, tried to do is protect what the PJ Tour is and what the PJ Tour stands for. And I think it will continue to, to do that. Dad, I think overall from what I saw yesterday relative to guys like Jay Monahan, who again, when he was questioned about his response to the complaints from 9-11 families, fully embarrassed himself with his response. We had Bryson DeChambeau on CNN the other day who appeared wholly unprepared for the questions he was going to receive when Caitlin, College na Caitlin Collins nailed him down. I feel like Rory McIlroy acquitted himself publicly, given the position that he was put in, better than almost anybody. Seemed to keep the focus on golf, didn't overpromise. There wasn't a bunch of moral musings in this. But what he said there I thought was really interesting. I still hate Liv, and this is about a partnership with PIF, when really, Dad, right. when we're looking at what the core of the problem this is for so many people is... The money where it's coming from is the issue. Rory is so deep in the golf portion of this that he did keep his lasers aimed at the guys he felt like left and threatened the tour to kind of show you where his focus still remains in this entire conversation. I mean, he was so adamant at saying this is PGA, this is DP World Golf, and this is PIF, not live golf. And as you heard there, he talked about how much he still hated it. He basically has has said what we, we kind of all see, right? Money wins. He said, we can't compete with the amount of money that's being thrown around here. So he has to resign himself to the fact that the PGA is going to accept money from the PIF. I mean, that's, that's just where it is. And his spin on it is, or his way to look at it is, at least we can control that money. I don't have a choice. We have to, we're, we're taking that money because this deal was made. And again, the players had no say in this. Um, but at least we get to decide how it's the money is spent. So I, I did. I thought he acquitted himself well. Um, Jay Monahan is having a tough time right now. And, and, and to his credit, he said, listen, if, if you want to call me a hypocrite, that's fair. I get it. Put it all on me. You know, this was what, what I was doing. So we'll see how he goes through this as they decide what's going to happen because nothing's going to happen this year. Uh, everything's going to play out this year. I think Live Golf will be gone. And one guy you haven't heard from, boy, they had him walk the plank, Greg Norman. Greg Norman's going to land on a whole pile of money, but that, that guy has just been absolutely thrown overboard on this entire thing. 
Yeah, he is he is gone and what's left in his wake is an exhausted Rory McIlroy. I think feeling a lot of the same sentiments we talked about yesterday for most people, which is it doesn't seem like we're going to be able to outrun all of this money. I am tired and so I'm going to try and make the best of this. All right, Dad, before we finish off the show, get everyone out of here with this, that, and the third, three quick stories to finish off the day. Want to make sure that people remember what's going on right now because you know this, Dad, and Brandon knows this. But for everybody else, Father's Day is coming up here pretty soon. I don't want you to mess this up here. It's not quite Mother's Day where you need to fear for your life if you somehow screw this up, but you also want to make Dad happy here. He's sitting over here, and all he wants is food. I always tell people men are simple to buy gifts for, make it edible, and it's usually going to work out. So with Father's Day right around the corner and delicious food on your mind, Omaha Steaks is the perfect place for these two things to come together. Because dads want steak. Don't let them tell you otherwise. They're lying to you. They all want steak deep down in places they do want to talk about at parties. And so to give your dad the best possible Father's Day, we want a chance to give you not only the meat that he's going to love, but the chance to grill it up too, because they all love standing in front of the grills, flip-flops or weird grill shoes and all. So for a limited time, go to omahasteaks.com and enter code GOJO into the search bar. You can order the dad's favorite gift package for just $99.99. Plus, you're going to get eight free Omaha Steaks burgers with the order. The burgers taste just like the steaks they're awesome i'm having two of them for lunch today they're lean and they've got a bold intense and yes beefy flavor what comes in dad's favorite grill pack you get four bacon wrap fillets four premium air chilled boneless chicken breasts four boneless pork chops four gourmet jumbo franks four made from scratch caramel apple tartlets and an omaha steak seasoning pack plus those eight free omaha steaks burgers All for just $99.99. Remember, this gifting is easy. Dads want steak, and Omaha Steaks aren't just steaks. It's the best steak of your life, guaranteed. So don't wait. Go to omahasteaks.com and type Gojo into the search bar and order Dad's favorite gift package for Father's Day today. Again, that's omahasteaks.com, keyword Gojo. Dad, you hungry yet? Listen, there is nothing like after doing some, some dad things like power washing cleaning out the garage like I did yesterday with the help of your mother, changing the filters. There is nothing like taking a raw piece of meat, throwing it on the grill, and turning it into something spectacular. That, my friends, is life from my side of it. So I would hope that would be the gift that's coming to me uh, from you. I would hope that Charlotte, who I feel I'm her, her TV radio dad, I would hope she would send me something as well. I say the same to uh, Jess Smetana, my partner on Golik and Smetty, being her on-air father, that she would send me some Omaha steaks as well. So I'm really hoping by the time Father's Day rolls around that I am buried in Omaha steaks and will be able to eat for the next year. All right, there you go. Well, it sounds like you got enough, you know, uh, TV daughters and sons that you don't have to worry about me, actually. So this is perfect. I'm going to outsource this to uh, to them. Uh, While they're worried about what they're going to get you for Father's Day, let's finish the show off with this, uh, this, that, and the third. And, Dad, let's start off with this. Major League Baseball might be doing a thing again. In the wake of Shohei Itani, I always said, I come to sports for freaks. I don't want to see people out there with ability like me trying to do their best to improve their life. I want to see mutants who I couldn't conceive of the things that they're capable of go and do this. And Ellie De La Cruz making his debut now for the Cincinnati Reds seems to be the next in line of this. 6'5", wiry freak athlete from the Dominican Republic who's just crushing balls with exit velocities we haven't seen. Went yard in an outstanding way the other day. His first big league home run came with 114.8 miles per hour off the bat and was a 458 footer. And dad, the most simple, elegant, swagged out bat flip after the home run. I am excited to watch more of this guy who's been somewhat of a like Paul Bunyan figure in the minors as he's coming up. Finally get a taste of the major league stage. Yeah, he's baseball, he's named baseball's top prospect a few years ago. Uh, and, and I love a lefty sweet swing, right? And that, that was it. I mean, he's got it. No doubt about it. One of the cool, and also let's go along with this. Another at bat, he hit a triple. He made it to home to third in what? 10.3 seconds or 10.8 seconds. That was the fastest home to third run this season. So not only has the power, but it has the speed. And then the one cool thing. The guy who caught the ball, it was a kid really, probably, probably in his twenties maybe, who caught the ball, 
they saw there were Reds officials talking to him. Next thing you knew, there was a picture of this guy and all his friends who were at the game, about six friends, all got signed balls, had a picture with De La Cruz as well, and the dude got a bat. He said he didn't want any money, just wanted he and all his buddies to get a picture with him and a ball. It was a very cool ending to that. That's called an investment because something tells me if the 21-year-old phenom has the career trajectory that started with this hit, those items might all be worth a great deal of money at some point soon. So hold on to those. Uh, this is like I lie to myself with all my sneakers and say it's an investment in your future. <laughs> so, uh, Dad, from one freak to a team full of freaks, let's get to that. Oklahoma softball takes a one nothing lead after a weather delay in the Women's College World Series against Florida State, and they were led by Jordy Ball, the All-American pitcher, who now continues her dominance. She has a streak of scoreless innings going back 21 and two-thirds innings, which is the most since 1998, and also scored the game's first run while pinch, uh, while pinch running in the fourth inning. So, Dad, Oklahoma softball we talked about, dominant streak right now they kicked it off again and they appear when now one win away from going for a third straight title yeah that's uh that, that game will be tonight they can end it i expect they will fit they, they have 50 i think 52 straight wins longest in division one history for softball their toughest game it seemed was getting into this against florida state when they beat stanford four to two that game was two to two in the ninth and they put up a couple of runs and got out of that one to get to the finals against Florida State, and uh, and uh, again, their first run was scored in the fourth. End up winning five nothing. They've they've blanked so many teams this year. So I I think the expectation is for them to raise the trophy tonight and clearly let them be called become and called a dynasty because they are. You go three in a row. I mean, it, it's pretty damn impressive what they're doing. Yeah, mutant effort from this team. Uh, there was an awesome web gem in that game there from Kaylee Mudd, yes. an outfielder for Florida State, that you'll see all over SportsCenter today. Yep. Late in the game, robbed a home run that could have ended things <laughs> entirely. You'll be seeing that all over the place. Awesome athletic motion. We've talked about it. Softball has been an awesome, awesome TV product for a while now, and that just adds to it. But, Dad, let's get to the third here. This one piqued my interest and might be leading to a road yep. trip. So... Apparently, I'm a, I love a good drive already, and part of my favorite part of every drive is the rest stops you get to encounter along the way, right? All the different I've driven through Iowa and gone to that Route 66 rest stop, that gigantic one that's a yep. palace to all the random things you could buy on a road trip. Cheez It is kicking off the summer with a destination rest stop now near Joshua Tree in Southern California. It has built a full Cheez It rest stop that places car fuel with snack fuel and boasts the world's first and only Cheez-It pump that pumps a stream of snacks into your car window. Now, Dad, I don't know if that means bags of Cheez-Its, if that means individual yeah, yeah. Cheez-Its, but as someone that spent a lot of time with this particular snack food in my old life at ESPN, I feel like for scientific research, this might be two and a half hours I got to spend in the car. I think you do because does this place not have actual gas either? You're just stopping for snacks. I, I'm trying to I'm trying to get into what this is and, and what's available there. But let me tell you, getting cheese that's pumped into your car, there may be nothing like that. That that's one of the greatest, at least greatest sentences I've ever heard. I I, I would like you to go there and see just if it lives up to what we are hoping it it it, it lives up to. It said it's got collectibles and a bunch of other exclusive merch that you can get at the shop too. But I'm with you. Like, I want to know if are they just going to put a hose in my car and fill it with cheese? It's because on the surface that sounds cool until you got to do the cleanup. Like me and uh, Jason yeah. Fitz, who was on the other day, once filmed a cheese it music video for a college football show we did, and part of that was we were throwing them everywhere. We filmed it at my house. I found cheese it dust and cheese it's in my garage yeah. in weird spots yeah. in the ceiling for like a year after that. So I don't know if cheese it's all over my car is exactly. Exactly what you want quick question you make make a road stop you're gonna only get one snack what are you getting iced honey bun iced honey bun i'm going with the uh the double stacked oatmeal cream pie Oh, yeah. Listen, a theme here that all roads lead back to type 2 diabetes for us. If you enjoyed Where the Road Led You to this podcast, download, subscribe, rate, review, leave us a five-star rating, and check us out here on DraftKingsNetwork.com. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Go, go. Boom. Money in the bank.